Morning, everyone. So I I first met uh, Ashish back when I was a postdoc at UCSF, and, and Ashish, he was a, a new professor uh, at UCSF. And at first, we didn't really interact very much. Uh, funny enough, we, we uh, really started uh, talking more when uh, the the pandemic hit, and uh, we started working on uh, on some COVID related research together. And that was really then that I learned a lot more about the really cool things that Ashish was doing in his lab. Um, and in the short time that we worked together, I learned a lot. And you know, these things that I've learned uh, has really influenced some of the work that we're doing now. So I'm really, really happy to have Ashish here. Um, I guess I'm supposed to also read off some of his uh, awards and accomplishments to kind of uh, show you how impressive he is. Uh, he's a he's a Valley Scholar, a Searle Scholar, and, and a Pew Scholar, and he's published uh, a lot of impressive work in top journals, which I think he's going to tell you about. So, uh, Shish, welcome, and uh, great to have you here. Great, thanks so much, Jenna, for the introduction, and uh, thank you everybody for joining and for um, for hosting this series. I'm I'm honored to be sharing the stage with Dr. Walensky, someone whose work I've followed for some time. So. Um, I will say one thing that would be nice in the future. So let me or like, you know, like let the junior person have a one-on-one -on, -one on the on the schedule with uh, with the senior person as well. Uh, but otherwise, super excited to talk to you all. So um, let me share screen here. Um, hopefully that comes through okay. Uh, okay. So what I'll tell you about today um, is our work on G protein coupled receptor signaling. I must admit that I'm not a cancer biologist. I am still learning even the most fundamental aspects of cancer biology from you know, outside of what I learned in medical school. But uh, what we are deeply interested in uh, in my lab are uh, is, is transmembrane signal transduction. And really the view that we have is that structural biology or chemical biology often can provide essentially um, the last mis missing puzzle piece uh, to be able to really uh, uh, target many of these pathways for, for a variety of diseases. So with that, let me just introduce kind of the broad focus of my laboratory, which is that we work on G protein coupled receptors. And this family of proteins is enormously diverse. They, um, they're so flexible in that uh, they can respond to an essentially inordinately large number of stimuli. Everything from hormones, proteins, ions, pH, or light, even force itself can activate one of these receptors. And that one of these, when these stimuli activate one of these receptors, that then leads to a, a shape change uh, on these receptors that, that then is read out by a whole cadre of a uh, slew of uh, signaling proteins inside the cell. My lab is deeply interested in understanding how these receptors work at the atomic level with the hopes that we can manipulate the function, the conformations of these receptors and thereby their function. Now it turns out that GPCRs are enormously important for almost all of human physiology. And here's a dendrogram just of the about 400 or so non-olfactory G protein coupled receptors that are in the genome. So I'm not gonna have you read out the names, but but suffice it to say that these receptors control almost every aspect of human biology, everything from how you think, um, your metabolism, to uh, your vision, your neuromodulation, how your immune cells talk to each other, uh, all of this and much more is controlled by the sheep protein coupled receptors. So my lab has a broad interest in trying to understand a whole variety of receptors, not just in cancer biology, but cross-cutting across many aspects of, of modern medicine. But what I'll tell you about today is one particular area where we've taken a lot of focus um, to understand a pathway that's critically important in human development, but also goes awry in cancers. And that is the hedgehog pathway. So just as a quick recap, the hedgehog pathway was discovered almost 40 or so years ago in a classic genetic screen looking for um, um, key uh, molecules that could influence uh, development. And uh, what Eric Weishaus and Christian Nusslein Volhard in this very um, classic study discovered are mutants uh, that had uh, a defect in the normal uh, body patterning of Drosophila larvae. And, and what they, dis what they discovered was a set of uh, genes that basically led to a so-called hedgehog phenotype where these little cuticles basically have, uh, you know, don't have this pattern, very clear uh, segmented pattern. This then, you know, basically looks like this cute little furry animal, which is a hedgehog, or for those of you who grew up in the nineties, like I did, you know, this, this great video game character, Sonic the Hedgehog. Okay, despite the cutesy name, hedgehog biology is absolutely critical for normal, normal development. So for example, the developing limb bud, uh, the hedgehog gradients define which side will become, eventually become the thumb or the pinky. And similarly, in the developing animal, hedgehog gradients will define what will become either the anterior or the posterior part of your body, your head or your toes. 
In adult tissues, dysregulation of hedgehog signaling leads to uh, important cancers. The most, the most, uh, be the best example of this is basal cell carcinoma, probably the most common cancer in all of North America. Not the most lethal, but certainly the most common. Uh, but there's, but hedgehog biology has been implicated in a variety of cancers. So we've been interested in you know, really the nitty gritty aspects of how this pathway works. And although this pathway was discovered almost 40 years ago, it's amazing that some of the most fundamental mechanisms still remain a little bit unclear. So now we're gonna zoom into the pathway. I'm gonna skip through you know, uh, probably 40 years of beautiful cell biology, developmental biology and, and, and biochemistry. But we know the proteins that we know that are at the core of this pathway are, are twofold. One, there's a protein called patched, which again lies at the cell surface and is, is putatively thought to be some sort of transport molecule. It basically moves some molecule currently thought to be probably a cholesterol or some sort of other sterile. And PACS activity at the basal state restrains and keeps off this G protein coupled receptor like molecule called smoothened. And the basal state, this glee transcription factor is basically made into a, into a repressive form. Now when the hedgehog ligand or the morphogen binds to patched, the proposal in the field is that hedgehog inhibits the function of patch or whatever this transport activity is that releases the inhibition on smoothened, smoothened and turns on. This then inhibits the activity uh, of some sort of, uh, of the conversion of glee to a repressive form and then glee goes on and does a bunch of stuff inside the cell. But fundamentally we don't understand as a field what, what really, uh, what is at the core of this pathway. We don't understand the exact substrate that's transported by patch. We don't understand how precisely hedgehog inhibits patch function. And probably what's one of the most critical mysteries for the field is how does patched have an action at smoothened at a distance? So how does patched actually regulate um, smoothened activity? So we've been deeply interested in this problem. And one of the things that I'll tell you about today is our work to understand how smoothened turns on. And this was something that um, really had perplexed the field and, and, and we think that we made an important contribution here. Now, in order to understand how membrane proteins work, um, we have kind of a framework that's developed out of a lot of work that I did in the past as a graduate student, along with many other people in the field, which is that uh, G protein coupled receptors, this is probably true for most signaling proteins, are really complex molecular machines. Uh, and, and what this slide is meant to highlight is that while we used to think of receptors as kind of bimodal switches, things that you could turn off, kind of like a, turn on or off, kind of like a light switch, what we now know is that receptors, when they're activated, are incredibly dynamic uh, proteins and they occupy a very large conformational ensemble. Now, the challenge for the, the challenge that this presents is that if, you, if you're interested in, in the structural biology of signaling proteins and certain GPCRs, you can't just go look at the, you know, look at um, something directly. You, what you really need to do is be able to trap one of these excited states in order to understand how a protein functions. That's been a really big a driving force for the kind of work that we do in my lab. We're interested in trying to understand active conformations of these receptors in order to understand how they signal. With that, we're also really interested in building bridges, not just you know, uh, trying to understand things that are very much at the structural level, but trying to bridge uh, our structural understanding with what happens at the cellular level. And again, the notion is that um, what has happened for a lot of structural biology to date is the ability to look at uh, low-lying or you know, relatively stable energies of pro you know, en energetic states of proteins. These are the ones that are either crystallizable or imageable by cryo-EM, but really what we're after are these active states or intermediate states that are important for, for activity. So the technique that we do, that we take to, to try to interrogate uh, these dynamic proteins um, is to raise these miniature antibodies called nanobodies. And the simple idea is that if these receptors are relatively dynamic, uh, what we can do hopefully is raise a nanobody that captures that excited state and brings its energy down, amenable to then structural biology. This is a little bit brief primer on nanobodies. We think these proteins are fascinating. I'd love to talk to you more about them. Uh, this is on the left, a structure of a conventional antibody that's flowing in your blood or my blood. And antibodies are pretty complex molecules are composed of a heavy and a light chain. And the business end of, it, of an antibody is this kind of this interface between the heavy and light chain that then you know, can bind essentially any antigen. It turns out that um, llamas, alpacas, and other camelids make these miniature antibodies called nanobodies. We're just the VH domain uh, of, of a heavy chain. And these nanobodies are amazing because they're small single chain proteins that are ultra stable. They're not glycosylated uh, and they're similar enough to human antibody heavy chains that, uh, that they're usually not recognized as foreign by the immune system. Here's just a comparison of the business end of an antibody versus a, a nanobody. This is an FAB fragment, again, composed of about six loops that can basically bind to any antigen, whereas nanobodies have you know, um, um, three loops that can deeply get inside small proteins. <laughs> 
Now, the classic way that nanobodies are discovered is to basically have your antigen of interest and immunize an animal. Uh, and over the past couple of years, working with Andy Cruz's lab at Harvard, we've tried to devise new approaches to find nanobodies without having to go into animals. So the idea is, is generally laid out in this slide. Uh, what we do is we, we um, try to generate new libraries of nanobodies that recapitulate the immunological diversity of an animal. And here, what we've done in the past is basically taken deep sequence data sets from uh, dozens of animals. And then we basically generate a yeast displayed library of nanobodies. And these libraries are very large, about 10 to the ninth or billion individual clones. And the experiment is as such, we have now a pool of yeast where each yeast displays a unique nanobody on its surface. We can then go fishing in this library to find a nanobody that binds to essentially any antigen. And the, the way that this works is that we have an antigen, for example, labeled with uh, a fluorophore uh, or a magnetic bead. And we can basically pull out those nanobodies that bind to our antigen of interest discard the non-binders and basically um, do this process iteratively. So this, so this idea you know, generally works for a variety of antigens, but what we wondered is could we use these approaches, not just discover binders, but nanobodies that would distinguish between different conformations on the same protein. Uh, and this is a project that, that was then led, led by Ishan Deshpande, a postdoc fellow in my lab, as well as Jiao Liang, uh, 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 a research technician. And we applied this to the smoothened receptor, again, looking for nanobodies that would bind to the active state of smooth and, and, and trap it for, for, for further study. So we did, it started with a, an antibody library of about 500 million variants and progressively over multiple rounds, looked for nanobodies that would bind to this smoothened protein only when it was loaded with an agonist, this case called a molecule called SAG21K, but not when it was bound to an antagonist called CAD cyclopamine. And we can get into the details later, but, but af after doing this procedure, we, we were able to identify about 11 unique clones that do this. Um, and one of these had really interesting properties. We knew that it could only react with the active conformation of smoothened because uh, if we do a surface plasmon resonance experiment, now we're laying down this nanobody, which we call nanobody eight, and then flowing over smoothened that's either bound to an agonist, cholesterol, which is the, probably the endogenous agonist of smoothened, or an antagonist SANT1. What you can see is that while uh, smoothened cannot bind to this nanobody when it's occupied with the antagonist, that's pretty robust potency of about 100 nanomolar. When, when it's loaded with an agonist or with cholesterol. We can also do another cool little experiment. And this is again, uh, you know, our early foray into again, building bridges between structural biology and cell biology. So imagine for a minute that we ha you have a nanobody that binds to the active conformation of smoothened. What we can then do is basically link up one of these nanobodies to a, just a simple GFP, express it in a, in, in, a, in a relevant cell line, and then test whether if the pathways turn on, what should happen, that the nanobody should recruit from the cytoplasm of the plasma membrane. So we've done an experiment like this. Um, again, what we're doing at the, at the beginning of this movie is there's a nanobody that again is selective for the active conformation of smoothened linked up to a GFP. And what we're gonna do in this experiment is ag sag 21 k Hopefully this movie comes across clear on your screen, but, but and, and what happens over the course of about five minutes in this case, that you can see the nanobody relocalized from the cytoplasm to the plasma membrane. So again, this is a little, it's a cute experiment because this is just in HEK cells, but uh, our hope is to use this approach now to go interrogate hedgehog signaling uh, in, in live cells that, that are ciliated and actually have the entire uh, part of the pathway. So in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip some of our validating work to show that we know that this nanobody recognizes smoothened in cilia, which is a very important thing for the field. But I'll skip to our structural insights, which is right here. So with this nanobody, we were able to capture uh, a crystal structure in this case has smoothened in its active conformation. So all the structures that existed prior to this had captured many, many instances of smoothened, but really only in an active state. So what you can see, hopefully see is that this nanobody uh, that came out of our library binds to the inside of smoothened and captures, again, this, this, this activated conformation. Now, the really unique thing that uh, came out of this work is that uh, we could, again, see small molecules like this agonist that we used to raise this nanobody in the first place. Uh, but, but two cholesterol molecules also bound to smoothen. This cholesterol in the extracellular domain had been previously observed by a variety of structural biology and the, and the extant hypothesis in the field was that this cholesterol on the outside is what's responsible for turning this protein on. But what we were able to see by actually capturing the active state is that there's a cholesterol bound deep within the seven transmembrane, like the, the heart of this protein. Subsequent work by another group, Cheng Zhang and Shakun Li, um, using cryo-EM as a method, 
Uh, in this case, using a full header trimeric G protein to capture this also showed a cholesterol, you know, kind of deep, deep inside the core of this protein. Here's again now a cutaway view. So if you um, uh, just basically slice smoothen in half, hopefully what you can see is that and there's a cholesterol deep inside smoothen. It sits right below the SAG21K molecule. And here's uh, the electron density that supports this. Now, we, we wanted to test whether uh, we're on the right track, whether this cholesterol bound within the seven transmembrane domain was really critically important for the pathway activation. What we could do is design mutations that basically would be predicted to abrogate binding of this cholesterol. And uh, what we could see is that the pathway could basically completely not turn on. This is absolutely critical because this tells us that this, um, that this locus for smooth and binding is probably the direct site of action where, where, where patch actually acts. Now, what does this tell us about um, the existing drugs that are on the market to treat a variety of hedgehog pathway-driven cancers? So for, for at this point, there's at least three, uh, two for basal cell carcinoma and one for uh, a blood cancer that's uh, where hedgehog uh, biology is implicated. And, and before this, before our work, it was a little bit unclear how these drugs um, actually had their mechanism of action. So again, a little bit about the chemical biology, what we've learned uh, there. Uh, but before that, I wanna highlight one very interesting thing that, uh, that, that, that we could uh, rationalize, work, previous structural activity relationship work that we could rationalize. So this is again, the SAG21K molecule in our structure, and this is a cholesterol molecule. What people had previously observed is that if you took, um, this functional group right at the end, uh, end of SAG21K. If it's a methyl, this molecule behaves as an agonist. But if you simply convert this methyl to an ethyl apropyl or an allyl group, just increasing the size at that position, uh, that dramatically converts the efficacy of this molecule from an agonist to an antagonist. And uh, we think our crystal structure directly explains what's happening here. You can see that basically if you displace this cholesterol, um, the same molecule basically behaves as an antagonist, really supporting the notion that this cholesterol is absolutely critical to turning this protein on. Okay, so getting back to these clinically used antagonists, here's just an overlay now of that same cholesterol and that seven transmembrane binding site, along with um, a variety of the clinically used antagonists as well as um, some other research antagonists. And hopefully what you can see is that all of these antagonists, you know, bind this little pocket up top here, but they extend a little functional group into this, into where this cholesterol binds. And our proposal is that it's really uh, antagon, uh, you know, competitive antagoni antagonism of this cholesterol that basically is responsible for the efficacy of these molecules. Now, a couple of years ago, uh, groups out of Stanford, out of Genentech, basically looked at what drives resistance in patients that get, for example, this Motigib or other smooth inhibitors. And what they, uh, what they identified were a variety of mutations that basically we've been able to map uh, localized right at the top of this pocket. So they, again, leave the cholesterol binding site for smooth and intact, but they basically abrogate binding of these inhibitors by targeting this, this allosteric pocket. Now, it turns out that Phil Beachy's lab about, um, you know, now almost about two decades ago had uh, discovered a smooth and antagonist from a very small screen called, and they called it SANT1 for smooth and antagonist 1. Uh, and we predicted that perhaps this molecule SANT1, because it doesn't extend in this allosteric pocket, where again, uh, resistance mutations arise, might actually be functional at, uh, uh, at some of these uh, resistance mutations for smooth and seed in the clinic. And that's data shown here. So this is again, just um, a, a graph showing pathway activity for the wild type protein. Again, the pathway turns on if you add hedgehog, you can turn it off with the clinically used antagonist with this Motigib or this blue antagonist SANT1. What's remarkable is that a clinically used, uh, a clinically observed mutant, this D473G mutation that basically uh, gets rid of Vismotigib efficacy uh, is still responsive to, to the SANT1 molecule. In addition, another constitutive, uh, constitutively activating mutation in Smoothin uh, is basically very minimally responsible to, uh, to Vismotigib, but, uh, but SANT1 retains activity. So at this point now, we're uh, engaging in, in docking campaigns, computational screening campaigns to find molecules that basically only overlap with the cholesterol molecule with the hopes that these might be really good inhibitors of smooth in, but perhaps don't have the same liabilities for resistance that, uh, that, uh, that clinically used antagonists have. Okay, so with that, um, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and talk, so that was all published work. I'll tell you a little bit about uh, unpublished work in the lab now. So uh, we wondered whether the same approach, uh, you know, what I showed you thus far was a nanobody that binds to the inside of the receptor, traps it in the active state, 
we wondered whether we could use similar approaches to find nanobodies that would target new allosteric sites on proteins like smoothin. And perhaps these new allosteric sites might be uh, uh, you know, new ways of tackling res uh, resistance mutations that are seen in the clinic. Again, we went back to the same approach, looking for nanobodies that were selective for a specific conformation of smoothin. Uh, and we discovered a completely different nanobody, which we call nanobody smoothin uh, 12, that has a very unique and interesting property that I want to talk to you about. So uh, surprisingly, we discovered this nanobody, again, looking for nanobodies that would bind to the active conformation of smoothin. And what we, uh, after a lot of work, figured out that it bound extracellularly. Uh, and here's a pivotal experiment that we did that, that convinced us that there's convinced us that it was doing something very funky. So this is a pathway activation assay. We're just looking at whether the pathway turns on the presence of, of nanobody. And hopefully what you can see is that, uh, you know, as we dose in more nanobody, it, it very weakly can turn the pathway on by itself. So this is a classic GPCR pharma, uh, a partial agonist. And we could verify this by basically turning the pathway on fully with the hedgehog protein and then dosing in the nanobody again. And what you can see is that now the nanobody basically behaves as an inhibitor and clamps signaling at about 20%. Again, very classic behavior for a partial agonist. Now we wondered how does this nanobody actually do its activity? And this is really funky, you know, for, for if it's binding the new allosteric site and you know impinging on smooth in this uh, very atypical way, how does it do this? Uh, and and we tried for many years to do this by X-ray crystallography, uh, without much success, unfortunately. But here we were very lucky to uh, to work with Yifan Cheng's lab, and and that's you know of course where Jianhua uh, trained, and that's uh, where I had a chance to meet Jianhua initially. Um, but there's a fundamental challenge. There's been a lot of effort, you know, to basically apply the resolution revolution by cryo EM to G protein coupled receptors. And that's worked really well if you have a, a GPCR with this very large signaling protein like a G protein coupled receptor. But if you just want to look at a single GPCR that's inactive, it's still very, very challenging for a variety of technical reasons. So we wondered whether a single nanobody, uh, which is again a pretty small protein, could enable us to get a cryo EM structure of, uh, of this GPCR. Uh, so again, Ishan Deshpande in my lab, working with Brian Faust, a, a joint graduate student between my lab and, and uh, Ifan Cheng's lab, we're able to um, show that this is possible. This is now a cryo-EM structure, pretty reasonably good resolution, about 2.8 angstroms, of smoothened bound to this nanobody called nanobody smoothened 12. Um, spin that around one more time. So you know, this is kind of on the limit of what we've been able to do by cryo-EM from a, from a methods perspective, really, again, pushing the boundaries of how small you can go with with EM if, if the samples you know, work well. Just to give you kind of an idea of, you know, if you're interested in drug screening, um, the quality of the electron density for the small molecule in this case, this is um, um, the map kind of around SANT1. Uh, and this is again, helping us basically do structure-based drug discovery for new molecules that target the SANT1 site. But in the next minute or two, what I wanna wrap up on is, you know, uh, what we know about this nanobody, nanobody smoothing 12. Now, one of the neat things about this, um, nanobodies that it binds in an extracellular epitope on smoothin that's pretty highly conserved. So this is just a conservation, you know, the area where the loops of this nanobody sit down. And hopefully what you can see is that many of these residues are basically binding to highly conserved sites. What's even more interesting is that this nanobody, while, you know, in our, in that initial assay looks like a partial agonist, really behaves um, as a, as an antagonist of the pathway. And there's two ways that we look at this, for example, in a a hedgehog responsive cell line, like an NIH two three three cell line, which is either looking at GLE one expression or patch expression, and hopefully we can see that the nanobody on its own basically has very minimal activity at turning the pathway on. This is you know the hedgehog response, you know the, the axes here are truncated, but you can see a pretty robust response. And by and large, this nanobody basically completely brings pathway activity um, uh, back, back to baseline. Just in our first foray into what uh, into understanding whether this amount of inhibition may be sufficient for um, for cancers that depend on the hedgehog pathway, we've been able to do some experiments in a med one medulloblastoma cell line. And here, what you can hopefully see is that um, uh, you know positive control, like one of these clinically used antagonists, is really quite effective at uh, at inhibiting the pathway. And this nanobody stands somewhere in the middle. So uh, there's a lot more work to do for us. You know, we want to make this nanobody a lot more potent. We want to understand at a very nitty gritty level, you know, how this nanobody has its activity. Uh, but I think what's clear is that these approaches to identify conformational epitopes on, uh, on challenging proteins like smoothened uh, can yield uh, new reagents that bind at kind of uh, new allosteric sites. So with that, I'll wrap up. If the key, you know, the key takeaway uh, I'd hope to get across is that you know, my lab is deeply interested in transmembrane signal transduction. And really what we want to do is build bridges between 
uh, you know, atomic level uh, precision biology to understand how proteins really work uh, and, and really the cell biology, the organ, organism physiology of, of G protein coupled receptor action. And we think that these nanobodies you know, serve as really great tools, chemical biology tools that basically span, uh, span these two disciplines. So with that I'll stop, you know, um, um, give some key acknowledgements. Again, all of the cryo-EM work that we've done is, has been in collaboration with Yifan Cheng's group. Ishan Deshpande in my lab has led almost all of our hedgehog biology efforts, a really remarkable postdoc that's gonna start at Genentech next year. Uh, key collaborators for us on all the hedgehog biology have been Phil Beachy's lab and Ben Meyer's lab. Um, and all the nanobody work we've done has been in collaboration with Andy Cruz's lab and his uh, ex postdoc Connor McMahon, who uh, just has left a couple of years ago. Uh, with that, I'll stop and take questions and, and thanks for your attention. Wow, oh, thank you so much. That was uh, an excellent talk. I have to tell you, I've been moderating this seminar series since when we began, which was, it's almost been a year. And this session is the one that I've been most nervous about because my understanding of structural biology is average for a cancer researcher. So I'd say not very good, <laughs> but this is really fantastic the way you laid it out for us um, so we could understand it. So Zeb had a question and I had a similar question as well of could you basically make like multiple combinatorial nano, na nanobodies that you could then give a patient to sort of attack different epitopes, which might be more effective. In yeah, I love this idea. Um, so the one could think about doing this in, in various contexts, right? One idea could be um, to develop so-called biparatopic nanobodies in the same protein. So, you know, nanobodies actually hit two different sites and um, perhaps not for cancer biology, but there's been a lot of effort to do this for, for, um, for developing nanobodies to, to uh, inactivate the spike protein of the SARS-CoV-2 protein. So you know, if you have two nanobodies that target different sites, if you develop resistance against one site, perhaps it's less likely that you'll develop resistance against multiple sites. So that's one way to think about it. Multiple nanobodies start targeting the same protein. Um, I, I think another way of thinking about this is, um, you know, modular nanobodies as modular handles for, for getting, specif uh, getting tissue specificity. So you could have, you know, for example, a module that um, manipulates signaling, but then, you know, a targeting module that basically, um, you know, increases uh, the surface, you know, activity at a, at a given uh, cell type or something along those lines. So we're interested in both of those. Um, uh, the former is a little bit easier for us to think about. The latter is a little bit harder because you really have to know you know, what a, what a good um, um, cell type selective epitope is. And so how, and actually that's, that's really germane to Francesca's question, which is, so how do you select a nanobody that's specific for the extracellular site or specific, are you pretty much constrained as to where you can do the nanobodies or can you pick areas that might be more effective therapeutically? Yeah, great question. So, um, you know, it, it really depends on how you set up these screens. Most of the screens that we've done, um, have been with purified proteins because you know that for our structural biology work we're, we're, we're pretty effective at it. One of the uh, big directions that we're going is trying to develop ways of screening for nanobodies that, um, um, that don't actually require purified protein, and that's uh, you know that's been a, a big bottleneck for, certainly for people that are not structural biologists or you know are not doing membrane protein biochemistry. So uh, and in those kinds of setups, you know we think that we can find extracellular binders for for things like G protein coupled receptors you know readily. So. Um, Again, a little bit more challenging, but, but we think that that's probably more generalizable than the kind of things that we've been doing to date, which is you know, using purified protein and then trying to tweak confirmation with known drugs, things like that. Um, yeah, yeah, really fantastic seminar. Um, I have one last question. You know, I try to keep this part short so that we then get Lawrence as well, and then we can have the panel discussion, which is always the most fun part of these. But I did, I, this is totally naive because I also don't know much about immunology, but. How does the human body deal with these nanobodies being therapeutically administered? Is, is it they're just cool with it or does it induce some sort of immune response? No, that's a great question. Um, you know, the, so there, there's real data from this from a company called Ablinx that, you know, basically brought nanobodies into the clinic as one uh, clinically approved nanobody therapeutic. And what they, you know, what they learned over, over the course of time, you know, actually bringing these into patients is that um, by and large, nanobodies are not that immunogenic, um, but, uh, but another you know, step you can do on top of that is basically humanize them. So, so you know, scrub uh, or epitopes or basically make them um, uh, into a corresponding um, heavy chain only gene from humans. And, and that's been pretty successful. So I think the approved therapeutic is a humanized molecule. That makes sense. Um, there are a few more questions, but I'm going to hold on to them for the end, and I will ask Francesca to come on and introduce Lauren.
Thank you, Ashish. That was really a fantastic talk. Okay, so our next speaker is uh, Lauren Walensky. Um, Lauren is uh, Professor of Pediatrics in the Department of Pediatric Oncology at Children's Hospital in Boston. And um, he's also a member of the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute uh, within the Harvard Medical School. Uh, so I have followed uh, Dr. Walensky's work for many years now. Uh, he's done some really beautiful work on uh, program cell death. His um, laboratory really did some of the very seminal work on understanding how um, proteins cycle from the cytosol to mitochondria to, to regulate program cell death. And um, he's developed very interesting tools, including things like uh, staple peptides, staple BH3 peptides in this case, that um, are act as um, chemical probes of program cell death, uh, as well as prototype uh, therapeutics. That was a, a really great comprehensive presentation. And I love the idea of activating back. That's, that's crazy. Um, I know Francesca had a question, so I'm gonna let her ask you the question herself. Yeah, I, I have the same question that Guy Salveson has. <laughs> And so, so first, let me just say, really fantastic talk. It was a great presentation. So, so the question is related to BAC. Um, and uh, so BAC is thought to be constitutively associated with the mitochondrial outer membrane through helix nine. Uh, and so do you think that the same kinds of mechanisms uh, that you describe for BACs are also operative for BAC? You know, I think that there's going to be some overlap, but I think there's also some things that are different. So, for example, um, you know, back does not need to be to undergo ligand triggering to move it from the cytosol to the mitochondria, because as you point out, it's constitutively there. So when we, you know, used our staple peptides to try to understand uh, BAK activation, um, we never saw interactions, you know, at the N-terminal phase, we saw interactions at the canonical location, you know, at the C-terminal phase. Um, and interestingly, if you take off the C-terminus of Bax, you know, kind of simulating this idea that C9 has popped out and it's inserted into the membrane, then we also saw our, our staple peptides bind to the C-terminal pocket in Bax. So I think that there's compatibility, um, you know, at the C-terminal phase, but that Bax has this extra step because it needs to move and translocate from one cellular compartment to the other. Now, once Bax is at the mitochondria, I, mean, I would suspect that there's a lot of similarities for how the execution phase uh, occurs. So um, just as a follow-up then, how might something like, uh, how, how might an anti-apoptotic protein then interact with either back or backs to protect? Yeah, I mean, I think that, yeah, I mean, the current understanding would be that, you know, the release of the BH3 um, is critical for propagation of backs and back activation. And so that the mechanism for, you know, suppression of backs and back is trapping that helix into its canonical groove and just preventing this whole auto activation mechanism, right? Because the auto activation requires, you know, BH3 um, exposure, that, like we showed for backs, you know, in, in what I discussed today. And so if you arrest that process, then you stop the self association and then you stop the membrane disruption. So, uh, and that certainly seems to be how and why, um, at least in part, these anti apoptotic inhibitors function so well, not only by disrupting complexes between, you know, the, the, the BH3 only proteins and survival proteins, but also between activated conformers of backs and back um, and survival proteins. Thank you, Laura. Yeah, and you know, along the same lines, a similar question that I had Zeb also has is, you know, VAX is often mutated in some cancer types. So could the oligoma that you um that you that you found, could that actually revert um the effect conferred by the mutations of of VAX in these tumors? Right. So what's interesting is that, you know, a lot of the mutations found in tumors are not surprisingly in the BH3 helix. Um, and I believe some are at the junction of the alpha eight and alpha nine. So they basically go after the fundamental mechanisms of the required BH3, a Bax BH3 interaction to self associate, and then also the ability of you know the alpha nine to pop out and translocate, and then also you know continue 
um, the, the, the self-association mechanism. What, what's been interesting for us now that we can like, you know, apply a detergent to backs and form this, you know, relatively stable homogeneous species of backs is that we can go into these mutations now and start to ask, okay, can that mutation, does that mutation actually block oligomerization or is that mutation blocking triggering? You know, and, and do some of the experiments that I showed you where you can start pulling apart different mutants and ask the question, is this an initiation problem? Is this a translocation problem? Is it a self-association problem? Or is it a permeabilization problem? And that to me is like the most exciting part about having this reagent because it's enabling us now to answer some of these questions about the various steps, which are hard to answer, you know, especially in cells, you know, everything in cells, it's really hard to answer. There's so much going on there. Right? There's all these modulatory proteins, there's all these modulatory conditions. You're, you know, you're in the membrane of the mitochondria. There's you know, different types of mitochondria. I mean, there's like all these different levels of complexity. So you know, at least in, in a biochemical way, if we re, you know, use a reductionist approach, we could at least come up with some hypotheses and then we can go into more and more complex systems to see if they bear out. For example, like with that double arginine mutation, you know, the obvious question is, well, wow, that looks like it's important for membrane disruption, but is that really the case in a mitochondria in a cell? So then we were able to do the recon work and say, wow, like it almost worked better than we thought it would. Right, like it was almost like you knocked out the protein altogether, and yet the protein was there. It translocated, it self-associated. It just didn't um, destroy mitochondria. So that was like a new, interesting, you know, finding for us. And so those are the kind of studies I think that you can do now. Yeah, and I think you know, sort of related to that, to the complexity in the cell, especially for pathways like Bax, Bax, you know, P53, because they're regulated by so many different moving parts, right? So the efficacy of this type of drug, so for example, Christina had a question which I think relates to this, which is what do you think is the relative significance of the direct BH3 only, the direct activating BH3 only proteins versus the ones that work indirectly by neutralizing um, the anti-apoptotic proteins? Like how is that going to play out in terms of the efficacy of using this treatment approach? Yeah, I, it's a great question. And it also, you know, and then the corollary to it is Jordan's question that I see in the Q&A as well. So, you know, to me, this is the fundamental issue around the drug development. And I think that the patients have given us the answer. So for example, if you've got, um, so, so the short answer to your question is, I think it's very clear now that both are operational. Right. Um, and, and, and the patients have shown that to us, right? And, and the, you know, looking into the cancer cells pre and post treatment and resistance and all that have shown us. So there, in, in cancer cells, there's a certain amount of backs and back that are already activated because these cells are undergoing uh, lots of stress, whether it's from you know, DNA integrity, DNA damage issues, whether it's immune issues, you know, whether it's hypoxia or nutri nutrient deprivation, backs and back are activated in these cancer cells way more than they are in normal unstressed cells. Okay, And this is part of like what Tony talks about, Tony Latai, the priming effect, right? So if you go in with a small molecule inhibitor, BCL2 or MCL1, you're going to be able to displace, right, activated backs or an activated back from these neutralizing pockets because, you know, the backs and back is activated. It's already there. It's, you know, temporarily in jail, but then you're like, you know, given the key and you're letting it out. Okay. That's one scenario. So that's the scenario where inhibiting antis, you know, inhibit the inhibitors is probably, it might be all you need, right, in that context. However, it's very clear that when cancer cells don't have enough activated backs and back, you can give as many of these anti-apoptotic inhibitors as you want and nothing's going to happen. Similarly, you can treat normal tissues with them. And if there isn't activated backs and back because the cell isn't stressed or not stressed enough, then those drugs won't do anything, right? So that's where the direct activation, you know, therapeutic approach could be particularly useful, right? Because now you could take the reservoir of inactive backs because it's always there for the most part, inactive back, it's always there. And now you can pharmacologically trigger it Right. And now you can load up the anti-apoptotics and start distracting them, you know, add more water to the sponge. And then all of a sudden, if you cut either, either that would be enough to overload the system by, by just, you know, outlasting the anti-apoptotic reserve by turning on more and more backs, or, you know, you set up these complexes. If there's a lot of anti-apoptotic reserve, you come in with your anti-apoptotic inhibitor that didn't work before. Now, all of a sudden it's going to work great, you know, in combination. So I think the fact that, you know, these experiments have now been done and these phenomenon have been shown, you know, between 
you know, sensitive, venetoclax sensitive cancer cells, venetoclax resistant cancer cells, and then normal tissue cells. And you see the different responses in the three types of tissues. You know, these experiments have now been done. This is a multi, uh, you know, dual kind of, you know, it has two parts to the mechanism. It's got the, you know, inhibit the inhibitor part, and it, it's also benefits from the activate the activator part. And it really just depends on what the wiring is um, in the cell. And then going back to Jordan's question, which is, you know, isn't turning on back, you know, maybe inhibiting an anti-apoptotic protein, maybe that sounds a little safe, um, you know, which actually in the old days, no one thought it would be, right? Everyone thought, gosh, you're, you're messing with the wrong proteins here. You're going to turn on death in cells and get tons of tox. Um, so now that we've gotten, you know, folks over the hump on that, you know, that inhibiting anti-apoptotic protein, anti-apoptotic protein isn't going to be like something catastrophic. Um, you know, the answer, the next question is, well, isn't turning on backs, that sounds way more aggressive, right? And, and the answer to that, from my perspective is, is that what's killing the cells when you inhibit BCL2 with venetoclax? Fundamentally, it's not inhibiting BCL2 that's killing the cell at all. It's the release of activated forms of backs, or it's the release of BH3 proteins that then go ahead and activate BACs. So the thing that's killing the cell, whether, you, whether you're using an anti-apoptotic inhibitor or a BACs activator is the same thing. It's activated BACs and it's activated BAC. So you know, we, we would expect the toxicity or lack thereof to be the same. And in fact, when Everest Gavathiotis did these experiments in mice you know, and, and treated with direct BACs activator to, to nuke these AML cells, did not see um, tissue toxicity and apoptosis induction or caspase 3 7 activation in the normal tissue, but saw it in the, in the cancer cells. So, um, you know, it's an interesting system. And um, I think it does pharmacologically benefit from tickling both sides of the equation, which is why, you know, my personal view is, is that, you know, there's been a lot of attention, you know, on the anti side, but I think there's a well of possibilities that, that, that can be mined on the pro side as well, especially as we figure out like how they work like how these proteins work. They're more complicated, they're hard to make, they're not as stable, you know, they have multiple regulatory sites, they change shape, you know, it's just different. I mean, in the old days, you know, the reason why it took maybe longer to understand this BACS activation is, you know, it's hard to immunoprecipitate, it's hard to crystallize, it's hard to keep things stable. You know, a lot of the techniques that we use to study BACS activation were not the standard techniques that you would use um, you know, for goodness sake, like just to get a calculated model structure of that interaction, we had to do the, you know, make the ligand weaker so that it would bind, but not be so aggressively changing backs in the NMR tube, and then use the paramagnetic relaxation enhancement to try to grab distance information over an hour or two period, you know, very different than just mixing two things that bind at femtomol or sit it down there, let it crystallize or immunoprecipitate, just very different methods to try to figure it all out. So, you know, it's taken longer on the pro side. And I'd actually like to get Ashish to um, comment on this as well. But what are, what do you think is the future in terms of potentially combining the nanobodies, for example, with things like these uh, uh, back activators, so that you're actually getting it into the cell that you think is driving the cancer? You know, in in this hopes of doing the sort of nuclear bomb drop off and killing those cells, right? Is that something that we could do, like we do with the conjugated antibodies now? to some extent, or are nanobodies just too small? I don't think there's anything unique about nanobodies in this case. You know, for most antibody conjugated drugs, um, you know, if that was an approach that made sense for, you know, targeting, for example, um, whatever, you know, specific cell molecule that comes out of that work. Um, I think, you know, there's already kind of a, a known chemistry on how to do a lot of the antibody drug conjugate work. And I, I think you'd really just want to plug into that. I, I will say, I really liked the, um, the, 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 you know, the known antibodies that, that, that sense out these specific confirmations. And I'm curious how those were discovered previously because they're really cool tools that already exist in the field to be able to you know, sense alternative confirmations of the, of the protein. You know, and and I'm, I know we're sort of running out of time, so I'm gonna end so on a general note that I'd really like to have both of you comment, on, which is you know, structural biology and cancer, I do feel like it's a little bit underappreciated in general in the field. What, uh, what is sort of like the future of, or what do you think is like the next big thing that, that structural biology is gonna help us figure out in terms of therapeutics or in terms of targeting things or delivering drugs? Yeah, I can go first. I mean, I, I think there's now plenty of good examples of where structural biology you know, has really led to um, the discovery of small molecules. And I think bumorafenib is probably one of the best examples of you know, really 
um, structure based, you know, discovery really at its finest. Um, but there's, you know, increasingly more examples of that kind of in the more classic sense of, you know, target and um, applying in a variety of chemical biology approaches to discover molecules. I think what's exciting to me is, um, uh, you know, the ability to use cryo-EM to get structures of very dynamic large proteins and, you know, the kind of stuff that Jen Hua here, I know here is doing um, to try to actually isolate these from native tissues or, you know, from, from cells with, with a lot of other binding partners. I think that kind of stuff could reveal true you know, new allosteric pockets or, or combinations of proteins that, you know, you couldn't try to just reconstitute de novo. So to me, I think that's where, where a big direction for structural biology and where it can make a lot of impact might be. I think it's really cool. I mean, a lot of the stuff Gino does, it feels like magic, like it shouldn't, he shouldn't be able to do it, but then um, it is super interesting. Your thoughts, Lauren? Well, I mean, you know, in, in looking over the past few decades, I mean, the thing that, you know, what, what's really exciting is I kind of feel like we're getting to this perfect storm of, of, of uh, opportunity for drug development and for the patients, right? So like, you know, so you have the human genome, you know that there's 20,000 proteins, you figure out what they are. Um, you know, some of them, you know what they look like, some of them you don't. When you know what they look like, you've got x-ray crystallography, you've got, you know, the blueprints for drug development, just like with this, you know, when that paper was published with BCLXL bound to back BH3, you know, by Abbott, um, you know, they had their marching orders, right? Like that's what we need to make. that. That, that, that helix, you know, we're going to mimic that. And so that led to, you know, SAR by NMR type drug development at that time. You know, it took a long time, but now, you know, without those structures, right, you need that starting point. So I kind of feel like you have the, the genome, the proteins, and then this big lag, you know, trying to figure out like, what are these bad cancer targets? Like, you know, MYC and RAS and, and, you know, all these things, like, what do they really look like so that we can make drugs? And so the ones that had structures, you know, they came first, but now all these other ones are coming online. So that means you're getting more and more blueprints, more and more marching orders for companies and academics to try to make compounds. Now you layer on top of this, um, you know, alpha fold and uh, people using alpha fold in combination with cryo and all sorts of, you know, mixing and matching to try to get as much data as they can. Then you add that to all the virtual screening, you know, for small molecules that's going on. So you can do real screening and then you can screen, you know, 5 billion compounds you know, on the side as well um, and, and start drug development that way. And, and at the end of the day, what's the end point? It's like to try to get something better, you know, for these patients, you know, across the street from me that are still dying of cancer um, and having relapsed and refractory cancer, but you can really see the impact of the changes, even if they come slowly um, in, in longevity, right? Like I, I think back 10 years ago, there was no CAR T cell therapy. Now, you know, a couple of years, come online and I see patients that absolutely would have died without a doubt, you know, whether they couldn't get into remission before a bone marrow transplant or they relapsed after a bone marrow transplant and there was nothing left in the bag, nothing left in the arsenal to do for them. Now, all of a sudden, you could bang these kids back into remission with a CAR T cell therapy and get them to their life-saving transplant or get them back into remission after a transplant that didn't work for them. And that's really where I see such incredible excitement coming out of this renaissance in structural biology, you know, whether it be the cryo-EM or, or the computational. It's so exciting, you know, from a physician standpoint as well, because, you know, new drugs are so desperately needed. And when they work, Gleevec, right? Venetoclax, right? Kinase inhibitors, you know, and you give it to a patient that's otherwise having a cancer growing out of control in their body, and then all of a sudden it melts away, like, wow, right? And if you can do that, you know, over and over and more of it, you know, that that's kind of what, to me, this whole renaissance is going to bring us, hopefully. I think that definitely speaks to the hearts of a lot of the peers at Burnham as well. So, um, all right, I'm going to let everyone go. Uh, thank you, everyone, the panelists, but also the participants for staying on, because I know I know we went on a little bit further than we should have, but um, glad to see that everyone enjoyed the discussion. Um, and I'll ask the panelists to stay on to do the training roundtable. And if everyone else can leave, that would be. Thank Good. you both. See you later. Thanks for, to both of you, uh, Lauren and Ashish. That's, a, that's really cool stuff. Um, actually, I just want to follow up, uh, Ashish, with the, the nanobodies. You know, I've heard of that there's these nanobodies that can cross uh, 
uh, membranes. Uh, have mm -hmm. you heard of these and, and do you know about these? Um, there's a lot of, well, there's a bunch of literature on this kind of stuff. I, 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 is there a specific one that, that you've encountered or, um, you know, a lot of people basically append on, um, you know, cell penetrating peptides or something like that. I haven't found a great example of, you know, data where it's super convincing that they're getting, you know, pretty high, pretty high delivery inside cells. But if you have an example, it'd be, it'd be great to see that. Yeah. So you're saying that there are antibodies and, and nanobodies that can cross the membrane, but they're not very efficacious in, in doing so? Uh, that's my kind of gestalt after reading, you know, a, a lot of the space is that there's not really a great evidence that you can get high quantities, you know, in, inside cells with these penetrating approaches. It's a great problem to solve. You know, whoever solves that will, <laughs> will, will provide a great boon to the world. But I, I think that it's still, to me, like an unsolved problem. Yeah, and so that, that's kind of related back to what Lauren was talking about too, and with the with the peptides that can cross membranes. I suppose because they're much smaller and could be potentially much more permeable. Um, and I suppose that that's probably going to be more uh, applicable for therapy at this point. I don't know if Lauren can, can comment on that. Well, you know, I think the going back even to the nanobodies, I think anything that like may not be possible actually could be possible, right? I think it's like a lot of things that, you know, we always thought couldn't happen, like uh, get an RNA vaccine to work um, after all the years of trying, uh, couldn't have happened at a better time. Um, so I, I think that there's a lot of, you know, getting things where they need to go, you know, in the human body has always been a big challenge. But I think that there's a lot of new, um, you know, technologies coming on board, whether it be, you know, targeting like the ADCs have resurrected themselves now um, because the chemistries are better and the, the, the known tar proteomic targets are better on cells. So I think there's a lot of interesting new um, possibilities that will really be able to play out, I think, in the coming years, regardless of size. Um, in terms of the, the staple peptides, you know, we've learned over the years by doing a lot of analysis of libraries that you know, it really comes down to the biophysical properties of the composition, you know, itself that determines, you know, membrane engagement, you know, initiating, you know, uh, macropenocytotic uptake, you know, efflux from, you know, penosomes once they're inside the, the cytoplasm, all of these factors. And now because there's great assays where you can actually track, you know, uptake and then release from vesicles inside cells, you could actually learn so much more about, um, you know, and start correlating what the process is you know, for getting from the outside to the inside and what, what your compositions need to be. And so for us, that's enabled us to kind of tune um, the peptides to get them, you know, to do what we want them to do, whether to stay outside or go inside. Um, and it, it, it ultimately comes down to molecular composition. Um, we recently, you know, did a, some work on antimicrobial peptides to try to understand, you know, they're so effective at, 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 at um, you know, at, 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 at blowing up at Bacteria that are otherwise, you know, very resistant to, to multiple drugs. And, you know, but one of the problems is it's been hard to get them into a selective mode that you could actually use them inside any species because they cause hemolysis, they cause proximal tubule epithelial lysis and kidney damage. Um, and so we just asked the question, like, is there a way to design these things so that they are selective for bacteria and not you know, mammalian cells and by making libraries and, you know, literally doing experiments where you screen them against red cells, screen them against bacteria and ask, you know, do they, do they kill one, the other, both or neither? And then when you get your buckets of results and you get ones that are selective for bacteria, then you stare at them and study them and say, well, what's so special about these, you know, that they're selective versus, you know, not hurting a red cell or not hurting a kidney cell. And that's how we figured out, you know, what the rules were to make AMPs or antimicrobial peptides selective for membrane. So I, I think that, you know, these are critical things like you talked about blood brain barrier issues, you know, it all comes down to threading the needle on what the right property it needs to be to cross the membrane um, or, or to get, you know, pinocytosis into the cell or, you know, whatever the me import mechanism ultimately ends up being. So, you know, along these lines, some of the early experiments on antimicrobials were using, were comparing things like uh, L forms and R forms with the thinking that the R forms would not be, um, would not be effective in, um, in human cells. And have you tried anything like that? Oh, oh, you mean with the amino acid? 
uh, yes. what, the, what the enantiomers were. We, we've yeah. pretty much been working with the, the natural um, amino acids, so I don't know. But um, what, what we have you know, really tried to dissect is like, what are the differences between you know, the compounds that are selective or not? And then what does that tell us about what you know, confers lysis versus what protects you know, a cell from lysis? And, um, and then once you have that information, then you, know, you could start doing it in a proactive way and start designing things into your peptides as opposed to kind of deconvoluting after the fact. Thanks, Laura.